to be sitting here talking today with my very, very dear friend, Dana Al-Masri. She is an independent perfumer with an exceptionally unique practice out of Montreal, and we're going to find all about how she's set up and how she's working and what's going through that creative brain of hers today. Um, so hi, Dana, welcome. I also want to say that the inspiration for this Meet and Nose series came from Dana, who has always thought that there should be more conversation um, between perfumers and available to our community at large. So thank you for that too. My pleasure. I feel like it's super important that uh, we give insight into how fragrance works but most importantly the people into the brains of the people who create these uh weird objects so it appears to me that you're sitting in your lab right now do you want to give us a little bit of a tour and tell us sort of how how you set up yeah um the tour starts here and ends here <laughs> <laughs> So it's a, it's a small, humble lab, which is actually much bigger than when I started. Um, I, uh, I've always started pretty much small scale ever since uh, we went to school. So once we graduated 10 years ago, almost more or less. Um, yeah, we were the class of 2010. So the whole time around this time we were in France and I returned and decided that I wanted to work independently for a variety of reasons which we can get into and um everything here is almost always um by need basis so i don't work with any um extras so i only order what i need with a little bit of leeway here and there um, but almost always i'm working in really 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 small quantities on purpose so that i don't waste but also because uh it's really hard to get access to things in you know within your budget and also like, because of the lack of space you can't really get like you know five kilo pediums and stuff like that um what was your second question and i'm so sorry you guys this might happen that my mind wanders everywhere so just wrangle me back into place oh well i don't remember a second question but so we can just continue on i think it's fascinating to see and sort of when when we, we talk about setting up a lab at the IAO, and those of us who work independently, we've all sort of gone through the process of thinking what is really essential. Mm -hmm. to so for you, what are, what are the essential tools? Um, I'm really inspired by Jean-Claude Elena. And when we met him in France, he had a lot of things to say about our perfumer's organ, if you remember. And it was a lot about just having the basics or materials that you could use in multiple formulas. So that's how I started. I said, I'm, I only have access to very few materials and uh, I buy them from the US. So from Canada to the US, there's the whole conversion rate. So it's quite painful. So I only started with the Hedion, the Isu E Super, the Ambroxan, like all of the basic, basic, basic things that you would use in almost all uh, accords or that you would need for all accords. So kind of like your baking pantry in a way you know like you need your flour you need your sugar you need all of that so um i did start with a lot of florals uh because i work around florals a lot so i definitely had jasmine i had rose whatever i could afford um i also took a lot of stuff from school to be honest i remember i made a lot of dilutions and took them i mean i figured we paid for it so uh what else did i start with alcohol it was mostly the tools that i needed so it i started with this baby scale if you can see it but i can bring it to you closer because i have like a double scale situation now. um i started with this scale that has actually been has helped me for the last 10 years as you can see like uh and this one takes 600 grams which isn't very much but when you're working in small quantities it's extremely helpful um, and it's very accurate. Um, so yeah, I work with that when I'm like compounding small things, but then when I, now I compound up to five kilos worth of stuff. So I'll have a larger scale that takes uh, a larger weight. Um, and yeah, tabletops and shelves is generally what you need most. Yeah. That, and then, yeah, all of just the, the droppers, the bottles, um, everything like that. And then I started, 
ordering things that I felt like I needed when I started Jasmine Sarai, my brand. So then that's when I pivoted into, okay, I'm going to have to start like ordering certain materials from this place because it's a little bit cheaper or I'll buy uh, all of these materials uh, because, well, I like cedar wood, for example, is in like three or four of my formulas. So I'll make sure that I'll have a much, much larger cedar wood. Um, so it was, it's just a way of replenishing inventory that has definitely changed, but setting up the lab is pretty much straightforward in that sense. Yeah. Do you feel like you design projects and choose your materials based on a sort of personal attraction to them? Or is it more of a, um, you know, I don't know, a technical sort of process for you? It's a little bit of both. I think it started out definitely more about pers personal preference, but then throughout the decade, uh, I've kind of loosened up and uh, looked at materials in a lot of different ways. One, once you finish school, you don't have access to new materials all the time. So my curiosity kicked in. And so with the fact that we had access to Perfumer's Apprentice, for example, which um, created, g gave us all of these um, captives, right, that we would not usually have access to, I would order things based on uh, curiosity. Or um, depending on the formula, if I had a project that required something really specific and I didn't have it, I'll order a small amount to test it, to look into it if I've never smelt it before. Or yeah, I'll order certain things based on only when I need them. Um, and then sometimes if I have the budget and the inspiration to play, I'll order um, the new molecules, the new captives that I've heard about or that I'm really interested in. And I mean, we all, this is a continuous job, right? So you're doing a lot of research all the time and you're looking for the newest things. And when, also when people are talking and blogging and if a new material pops up, you want to be able to be like, oh, I actually know what that is, right? So it's, it's actually all of it. Yeah, if that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. Well, tell us a bit more about the creation of your brand. You started as an independent perfumer all on your own. Tell us how you got started. Tell us how it's changed. Tell us how you're seeing that practice right now. <sighs> so it started... Um, in grass, actually, in a way, uh, because I felt finally for the first time in my life that I had found uh, a medium that worked for me. And I also started seeing a lot of the connections between scent and sound, right? Um, and that's when I started to do a lot more research and realizing also that I had synesthesia. And so it was a lot of awakening um, during that period. And more importantly, upon my return, or once we were starting to apply for internships and realizing that the French market was very saturated, for one, and two, that I didn't really belong in France, uh, whether it's my personality or my, you know, my mannerisms, whatever it was, it was just not the place for me, um, that I decided, you know, looking at Montreal, there was no there weren't that many fragrance brands at the time, even now. And I felt like I'm not very good at what, you know, being told what to do. And I just didn't, I couldn't imagine waiting like 10 years and working on soap formulas for like six years and not being able to, to do what I wanted to do, but also just certain bureaucracy and certain things that I saw within the perfume system were just things that I wasn't um, willing to deal with. So I decided screw it, I'm just going to go independent. And having spoken to um, Yosh Han specifically when we went to uh, Pitti in Italy, uh, and she told me the story of how her and Inika had started in the same place and taken extremely different um, trajectories where Inika went to Kasago and went into the classical route and kept continuing to work for other um, companies, whereas Yosh decided I'm going to go rogue and go independent, and they still ended up in the same place. It gave me hope that you know what we can we can do this. We can I can I can do this. Um, it's possible. And my dad said I always have a habit of taking the long hard road, and this was no different. 
and and that was it you know um and then knowing that there wasn't that much of a scent culture in montreal even though it's a french culture it's super different than france um i just felt like you know what it could be really interesting and furthermore the connection between scent and sound i felt like so many people didn't understand fragrance and fragrance is so subjective and so specific and so personal so that if i connected it to something as universal as music and something as approachable as music then perhaps people could find ways to interpret perfume uh in a new way in a multi-sensory way and, and in an easily um digestible way yeah and how has it changed since yeah how has it changed since you you got started everything has changed you guys i mean <laughs> Even I started bef right before the IAO, um, and the reason I connected to you guys was because I applied for an installation idea or something, and it was much too big at the time. Um, being able to be experimental with perfumery and pushing the whole uh, avant-garde idea of perfumery and pushing your imagination um, past the bottle and using scent as a medium in spaces and, and all of that has completely changed. So I'm very happy that people are now more interested in that and um, looking into more multi-sensory, um, multidisciplinary type of um, experiences. Donna, can you tell us a little bit more, I'm seeing questions, a little bit more about your relation, your synesthetic relationship between music and sound? Yes. Also, can you talk a bit about some of the sort of more art space projects where you've used scent? Sure. Okay. So tell us about your synesthesia and the music and the sound. And how so that. the synesthesia is, um, it's a word for the merging of the senses in its most basic form. Uh, we all are born with it in one way or another, right? And then it kind of just separates into our senses. But I totally believe that we all have the ability to... Uh, experience the world in more than one sense at the same time. Uh, with that said, in perfume school, I started to realize that all of my weird synchronicities made sense in fragrance because we would describe fragrance in uh, musical terms or colors or shapes and all of these things that I already were like already came naturally to me. So my first bout of synesthesia or my understanding of it was when I was like, oh, every day of the week has a color and people didn't understand. I kept saying like, oh, why, how do you, how, do, how, how is Thursday not winter green to you? Like Tuesday is a very specific green, but Thursday is a winter green, Wednesday is orange, Monday is magenta, Sunday is yellow, Saturday is like a, it's a weird hobnob of colors for me sometimes. And so that's kind of where it started. And then perfume school kind of reiterated that because we were using a lot of multi-sensory language and then it was um, reiterated with all of the musical language. And then my uh, experience with remembering certain materials, I'd be like, oh, this smells like, like incense for me smells like synths. It's very sharp, it's very cold, it's very like jagged. It, ha it has the same kind of like sound wave as well. Um, and then the work of Septimus Pies, The Art of Perfumery, where he put like, um, or equated different chords with different smells. Um, so all of that kind of jumbled up and I, I just realized, oh shit, like I have synesthesia and I didn't realize there was a word for it and it just kind of all made sense. And so uh, upon starting Jasmine Sarai, uh, I wanted to connect scent music and culture because I felt like the cultural aspect of scent was very, um, uncovered in a way and there was so much sense culture that most people don't even realize and very specific to many cultures so it's important to kind of see the connections between all of those things and that's kind of been my whole life ever since just being cross-modal in every way so my first installation was called smell the jasmines and i chose the jasmine because it represented a lot of different countries and it was uh, the cultural flower of, like the national flower of many, many countries. And it was um, a purely olfactory installation. It was just based on multiple different, um, sorry, different smells of jasmine, whether it was jasmine absolute or the jasmine flower. And it was encased, so you kind of walk into it. So it's a self uh, reflection cocoon. And some people cried in there because it brought them back home. There was, 
a few refugees who had said like this brought me back to Damascus or there was Filipinos who said oh my god this reminded me of my mother so it, it was part of it made me realize that obviously I want to use scent uh, not just in perfume form, but in a way to help people um, discover themselves, in a way to start conversation, in a way to explore other senses and, and situate themselves within that. Um, it's all of it. Yeah. Yeah, I always feel like um, one of the most empowering aspects of scent is that it's so subjective, it's so personal, and that everyone's you know, preferences um, are taken into account everyone's language, everyone's history, personal story, cultural background, geographic location, all has such an intense sort of um, effect on how we perceive and communicate about scent. And, you know, I know your history growing up in a sort of very global fashion, you bring to the world of what is generally, you know, a very westernized European trade, um, a very different view. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your culture, your history, your background, and how you feel like that interacts with the world of fragrance at large. Um, the main reason I'm a perfumer is because I'm Arab. I know this to be true wholeheartedly because all of my smell memories are from where I'm from. And the way uh, I'm Lebanese Egyptian, to give you guys some context, and I grew up in uh, Dubai, which is in the, in the United Arab Emirates. So it's a very, and they're all highly different countries with highly specific cultures and entirely different languages in a way uh, and dialects. And that, Growing in that microcosm of different nationalities, uh, growing up in a different country, uh, and experiencing all of the different smell cultures has 100% influenced me as a perfumer because all of my smell memories are based on that. Um, all of my smell language interactions are based on that because in Arabic we have a lot of smell language So it's a part of our poetry. It's a part of how we say good morning to each other. It's just such a it's a huge part of our identity um, What is that then, greeting, Dana, the greeting to say good morning that's scent based in Egypt and in some parts of the Levant um, which is Palestine Syria Jordan and uh, Lebanon we say sabah al ful wal yasmin which means it's a it's a morning full of jasmines and jasmine sandback mm -hmm. and you can even say sabah al wird which means like uh, a flower morning or a morning of flowers mm -hmm. if that you know it's it's much more poetic in arabic but that's the more literal translation but in any case you're saying good morning be like hey flowers you know, it's, it's just so nice and so refreshing and so warm. It's so beautiful. It is. And it just, it, it actually makes you feel good when you hear it. You know, that's kind of what I miss about living in the West is people don't say good morning to you the same way I find. And uh, they just, I don't know, there's the warmth is, is missing. You know, people are looking you in the eye and being like, I hope you have a beautiful, smelly day. You know, it's like, wow. Yeah, I, lo I love it. Um, so it's just a... Yeah, it's just a way of life. And I kind of want to be able to explore that and share that with people, you know, because when it comes to smell culture, there's so many different cultures with their own specific smells that are actually quite fascinating. And you learn so much from like an anthropological um, perspective. Uh, I went on a tangent there, but yeah, bring me back. It's what a great was your second thing. question? You asked me like three questions in one question. So it's a it's it's dense questions. I need to work on this moderation technique of mine. So, so for you having that varied background and being an Arab, what was your experience interfacing with this industry, which is very still, it's changing, but very notoriously, you know, Western, white, male. Right and secretive established and you know sort of story what was what was that experience like i've definitely learned quite a few lessons but the fact that i have an international back background uh, makes me adaptable which i think is the most important thing even as a perfumer when you're creating you have to be adaptable in order to give someone whatever they're looking for right um, when it came down to industry stuff to be honest, I think I had a, a bit of a harder time than most because I am very sensitive, admittedly, and I'm very passionate. And 
my passion can sometimes translate, um, you know, loudly. And in the French dynamics that we were in, um, that didn't seem to be understood all the way, which I now also living in a French uh, province and all of that, I get it. Like we're just different. Um, we have different ways of expression. Um, but it's also, how do I say this? I find that over time, certain perfumers have the ability to um, distinguish between their work and themselves, right? And their, their heart and their product or their results. I can't do that. Like after 10 years, I've been doing this 10 years and I still cannot do that. Every thing that I make is still a part of me, even if it was made for someone else, because I want to put my whole heart into it. And I care about whether it does well. I care if people hate it. I care if they love it. And you and I have had this conversation where you've grown to be able to kind of disconnect yourself from that aspect of things sometimes, but I'm still very, I'm like, ah, no. And I remember the biggest lesson was us in school and me pushing for our, uh, the perfume that they chose and me trying to push um, a very specific Egyptian point of view and how there was a lot of um, pushback because it was too oriental, which I resent. And I felt like, one, how would you know? It might be too oriental for you because you have a very specific viewpoint or taste. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to represent a specific time and era as accurately as possible while also adding intuition and an imagination and all of that sort of thing. So it's, it's such a, it's really hard for me, even to this day, like when I saw Pin Halligan's push out a perfume called Cairo, I was, I'm sorry, I was fucking mad because I was, I asked them, were there any Arabs in the making of this perfume? Um, were you uh, looking at it? Like, what, we, what kind of story were you trying to tell? Because for me, it just looked like it's a British company trying to use a fabled city, which still exists, um, the story of a fabled city called Cairo with rose and amber, which is completely misleading and not at all um, representative of Cairo at all. I'm sorry, Cairo smells like burning garbage, you guys. And it's actually one of my favorite smells. I love it. It's smoky, it's beautiful, but it has all of these other um, elements to it that have nothing to do with amber and rose because those are highly orientalized materials. So over time, I think I'm even more vocal. I don't know who wants to hear it, but definitely more vocal and maybe a bit more pissed so I don't know if I've mellowed out at all. I've actually gotten more political in that sense. And I don't know if that's the angle I should take, but I almost feel like, there, I, how, how can I not? Because there's just, even with conversations with you and Saskia over time, you can see that there's so many things that are wrong with our industry. And now we have the, cha we have the ability to change that. And we have the ability to tell stories that most people's story, like these stories cannot be told. And so if I'm one of like, I think six or seven Arab perfumers in the world, then I'm gonna take that responsibility and be like, oh, can we tell our stories uh, in, a, in a more productive way, in a kinder way, in a more accurate way? Um, and I've used all those experiences from France where I felt like, okay, I need to maybe mellow out or shut up or change my approach a little bit. And I have, but there's also, now there's stuff that I, I, I there's, I'm not gonna shut up about it anymore, you know? Absolutely not. And I think, you know, the, the challenge and people talk a great deal about the fragrance industry using the term oriental um, as this, uh, you know, exoticism of uh, telling a story of a faraway place. And I think that, you know, the real the resolution to that is allowing um, the space for people to tell their own stories and to define themselves. And so you are a very singular and unique voice telling the story of people who has not been represented in the world of fragrance. So I mean, I think we're all very what grateful we don't even realize is, thank you. I mean, what we don't realize is that perfume is an ancient Mesopotamian art. It's not French. <laughs> so no. I think we should, we should yeah, give credit where credit is due. 
And just so you know, your your passion and your intensity is very well received by our oh, audience. Oh, okay, good guys. Thank you. I hope I'm not too <laughs> intense. I can get heated. I can get heated. That's for sure. And I think um, you know you do, and I know you. You put your heart into your work, fully and completely. And I think that for us as an audience, we are so lucky to be able to receive that. It's a gift that you share with the world. Um, what are you What are you excited about? What are you curious about today? What's inspiring you today, or what's challenging you today? Well, what's challenging me today is our current global pandemic, as I'm sure it's challenging everybody. And I'm having a hard time being inspired, actually, because I feel like it's a little frivolous to be creating, even though I know that that's what's going to save us in a lot of ways. Um, it's very hard for me to get creative and make something right now because I'm in survival mode when it comes to my business and I'm worried about everyone all the time. And I also want to, I'm taking this moment to really try to also reevaluate what I'm offering. And I want to make sure that I, I provide people value. That is really the most intrinsic part of what we do is that it's about, making people feel good. And that's what I don't want to ever let go of. And like that is, I'm hoping that that is the value that I give to people that and, and knowledge and, and being able to share that knowledge. So just pivoting in that way to, to, to see like what is necessary, what's needed really, what can I do? What can I do to help? And how can I um, be kind to myself in the process? And also just trying to fall in love with perfumery again. I feel like while I also am passionate, I've lost a lot of my passion for studying because I'm so caught up manufacturing. And now I'm in the product development mode and all of these different things, like I'm working, you know, 25 perfume jobs in one and I'm evaluating and doing operations and my regulations and I'm not creating as much anymore. And I want to be able to, um, to do that because even with my last perfume or my newest perfume that I sort of anticlimactically launched Fayum, it took me, I worked on it for three years and I had started, it started as a creative project. Um, and it took me a really long time to decide to make it public. And once I made it public or decided to, I started changing the formula and questioning it and wondering, ah, oh, should I put it out there? What if people don't like it? What if they say it doesn't have a long enough sillage? or it's not tenacious enough, or it's this, or it's that. And, you know, like your, your creative mind just disappears. So I'm trying to kind of just get back to that and like read again and look over all of my, um, like all of, I have the, my notes from Gross. Like I dried flowers in here, you guys, like, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to get back to, her again just the the student because you never stop learning and that's what's so amazing about perfumery so there's so much that you can always continue to learn and and read there's so many books to to look into there's just so much so much to research so for your last perfume the Fayum can you tell us what the inspiration was and how it got started how it, sort of what the first sort of pass was and then maybe what it evolved into yeah, so it initially started, I was the in-house perfumer for a company called Joya in New York, and I was making a lot of stuff for them, and I was extremely overworked, and I was, I live with anxiety, so moving to New York, working this crazy job with all of these projects, plus running your own business is, uh, it was just madness, and I couldn't do it. Some people can, and I couldn't, um, and I decided, uh, my mom, I had uh, my first two week paid and only vacation of my life. And I took that time to go back to Lebanon and Egypt to visit my grandparents because I miss them. And my mom uh, was in Egypt with me at the time. And she, uh, her friend was like, let's go to this place called Fayum. And Fayum is a small village in, uh, in Egypt outside of Cairo, um, mostly known for cotton. Uh, this is actually by a brand called Cotton, K-O-T-N, and they make a lot of stuff there, actually, all by hand. And cotton is a huge um, Egyptian export. We have, we have some really, really soft cotton. All this to say, I go to this place, and they also have this pottery village, um, and it essentially changed my life, um, quite simply because I saw 
all of these artisans creating clay, playing with pottery, making their own are taking really quite a long time, no deadlines, no make, 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 like in New York, no, none of that. And it was just the beauty of seeing them so happy and so content with themselves and so warm and lighthearted and just so um, satisfied with life and with creating. And it started to really get me excited. And um, oddly enough, I, I could smell mimosas everywhere. And it blew my mind to find mimosa in an Egyptian desert because that's not really possible. I'm like, wait, how does, why or how did this grow here? And it's because Fayum used to be kind of like a vacation town for a lot of French and uh, Swiss poets and, 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 you know, rich people, essentially, uh, back in the 70s and the 80s. And there's a Swiss potter um, woman who had, who had met and married an Egyptian poet and started this village, taught the locals how to make all this stuff. And with that move, someone had brought over some mimosa. And, they, and that's how the mimosa started to, to grow everywhere. What and the mimosa is so much... Um, what does it smell? What does it smell like for you, Dana? The mimosa. Mimosa. Mimosa is. Um, it's floral. It's nutty. It smells um, almost like as if you could smell marzipan from like a really like in the wind almost. So it's not at all almondy, but very light and nutty and and anisic, and very fluffy. Um, Egyptian mimosa is a little scruffier. Um, so the flowers are a little bit rougher and bigger and darker than French mimosa, I find. So the, the French mimosa is a little bit more delicate, whereas the Egyptian mimosa is, yeah, definitely ru more rugged. <laughs> um, yeah, that's how I would describe it. So the mimosa is floating around this town. Everywhere. And I'm fine. And it's just catching it and catching it and catching it. So I just decided, okay, you know, I'm just going to write a little formula and see what happens, you know, just for me which was the first time in a while. Because again, all the stuff I'd done for Joya was not for me. And so, um, yeah, I came, I decided to leave New York uh, pretty much after that trip. <laughs> and I said, you know what? No, I want to take time to create again because especially because I make everything by hand, I truly believe that everything that you make, your energy transfers, right? So you don't, I didn't want to, to transfer all my anxiety and all my pain into my work anymore. And I wanted to make sure that I had time to breathe and to take time to, to, to make sure that Jasmine Sarai sur survived because once I was in New York, it did very badly, you know, and I couldn't put my mind in a million places and I needed to refocus. So upon my return, I did just that. And I launched two perfumes inspired by the Middle East that I had been working on prior to that. And they were paused. And then Fayum is now. So it took me three years um, and it changed a lot from its essence, but it hasn't changed that much. So whatever I sent you, which um, I sent, I, I sent Ashley pretty much everything. She's the only perfumer I truly trust to give me a good opinion and not to steal my work. Um, but it's also just, I miss having that camaraderie from school and to have someone give you uh, their opinion and it's constructive, but it's also curious and it's very honest feedback. So it was always super helpful. And based on your feedback, actually, I kind of just started again from, it, almost always it's like the first three formulas that you end up, you're like, oh no, you know what? I'm gonna go back to that one. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how it was. and. Today, it's, it's more or less the same. Um, I just had to change a few things for, for Ifra reasons. I couldn't have as much violet as I wanted and all of that. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it's become now. It has notes of violet because there were violet trees and then, or shrubs. Uh, a drop of Egy Egyptian jasmine, because how could I not? Um, mimosa. I recreated the scent of clay or Egyptian clay, like just all the handmade yumminess. Um, it's very dusty and very breezy. And I also wanted to bring in the scent of um, palms and just palm trees because I love them so much and dates because I, I thought a date accord would be interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I may not have seen the final version, but I know. I know where it was moving along the way, and it is indeed a lovely, beautiful, inspiring scent. 
Thank you. I just wanted to create something that wasn't actually political, ironically, or anything about a specific anything except for the place. I just wanted to take you back to that place and I wanted to be as accurate as I could. So I've had people from Fayoum specifically say this smells like Fayoum. And that to me means more than anything because I know that like the people from that land yeah. uh, approve it, you know? And it's not orientalized in any way. It's not overly sweet. It's not overly woody. There's no oud in there ever. Uh, you know, it's telling a different story and I hope it's a positive one. And it's also, I hope it's also informative because that's also part of it is that if we're trying to tell stories, I hope we're telling stories that could also teach people about who these people really are and what these places are really like or really about. So that sounds like it was really a translation of your personal experience of a place into a scent. Yeah, which is very rare. I never do that on a public, um, like as a product, I don't do that often to have my own subjective opinion, even though Jasmine Sarai is my interpretation of music uh, or sounds within culture. Um, I still look at it from, I try to have a very like globalized view of it. Like Mare, which is an homage to Feirouz, who's a, a Lebanese singer and icon, um, I also tried to synthesize Lebanon and the scent of Lebanon and what that would mean to people living outside of Lebanon and what it means to live in exile or, or, or as, a, as an expat or, or, or just looking back on life and being like, well, I can't even go back home. And almost always you remember the scent or the essence of that place. Um, so I, it, I try to take myself, remove myself as much as possible, but I, I you know, it's it's hard not to in, in that sense as well, because I also, I want to make things for people, yeah. you know? Yeah. And we're our own best connection to each other often. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. I want to say, um, we were talking about it yesterday. Uh, my mom and I talked about how we could classify Fayum as a scent because I didn't want to classify it as Oriental. And so um, if anyone's interested in reusing this term, uh, please go for it. I'd love to reapply uh, words to this fragrance family and start maybe by saying Neo Eastern. That could be interesting, maybe if it doesn't offend anyone. I think that's a great um, concept for shifting the language of the category. Um, Definitely. Uh, traditionally, do you want to talk a little bit about what Oriental fragrances were conceived as by, you know, the Western world? Was it the Guerlain family? Very, very much so. All those, yeah, right? All those really sweet, spicy, uh, balsamic Money. fragrances. So I believe it started with, uh, I want to say, Jiki. Um... And that's also, that's where the problem started as well. Creating scents inspired by an ex a so-called exotic place um, and not really being that accurate, but also using that to sell to that place. Mm. Kind of like a Gulf of Fragrances now, you know what I'm saying? Like the whole oud craze. What is the oud craze? That's specifically so that all of these French and non-Arab companies making money off of these fragrances to sell to a very specific, very rich uh, microcosm on, on the Arabian Peninsula, which is not representative at all. So when it comes to Oriental, like the Oriental family, I think it's, it goes hand in hand with Orientalism and it goes hand in hand with the Occidental view of what the Middle East or, I mean, again, we talk about Oriental, are we talking about the Middle East, are we talking about China, are we talking about Malaysia, are we talking about Thailand, like it's just too general of a term, it's too problematic, and actually it doesn't say anything about the fragrance family, right? Like we were talking about, okay, maybe we should classify it as ambery or uh, resinous or whatever, but it's not representative of anything to me. So I just, it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. And historically it was just for, I think, Emmy. Who decided okay well let's call it that because right now we are in the throes of orientalism and they didn't know any better um and it was just basically what the combo of vanilla ambrine and i'm i'm i don't remember now yeah just vanilla and ambrine right labdanum labdanum and, labdanum and vanilla and bergamot 
Yeah, well, it's, yeah, so spices, resinous, sweet notes, and definitely some citrus on top, like Shalimar. Um, yeah, so it's also problematic, even Shalimar as an inspiration for a lot of Indians, for example. So, um, Neo Eastern, what do you think would be classified as a Neo Eastern scent? Well, this is the thing. Do we want to get regional about it? Do we want to get like a fragrance family? Like that's the part where even in the class that I did in LA, that's the question. How do we classify families? Are we classifying them as a scent culture? Or are we classifying them in fragrance, uh, literal fragrance? So what creates a Neo Eastern for me would be if I were to classify Fayum, or if I would classify Nar, Nar for me uh, is my, my fragrance inspired by an Egyptian um, singer and my grandparents' um, love story. And it smells like fire. Um, it's ambery. So I would call it an ambery Neo-Eastern or a Neo-Eastern ambery. Or ambery, one. Neo-Eastern, one. So I don't think that they're, they need to be together because ambery says a lot about the fragrance. Neo Eastern can say some, or about the smell. Uh, Neo Eastern can say something more about the story mm -hmm. or the origin. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I'm not saying, oh, it has to be just that, but I just think that it's more interesting, which is why I said like, um, who won, uh, there was the Malaysian uh, perfume that won one of the AO awards. Uh, Miyako by Ophir. Miyako, exactly. Okay, so Miyako, let's talk about Miyako for a second. That was a very like Osmanthus scent, if I remember correctly. And it had all of these beautiful elements. But to me, I would have never called it an Oriental. You know, I would have, like, to me, it was very specifically Malaysian, actually. Because it was, it was representative of their point of view. They had a story that was very specific to Malaysia. They had materials that were in that, used from that region. So you can call it a floral, you can call it an ambery floral, you can call it a powdery floral, you can be very specific about it smell wise, but also how about we get into it from a different perspective and remove oriental, the oriental category entirely and try to classify things just more specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a big a conversation we will continue to have around this topic. Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely an ongoing conversation. I do see a couple of questions, Dana. You mentioned a bit about doing research. Um, and so apart from, um, you know, visiting places and sort of taking that personal sort of immersive experience, mm -hmm. you research scent or you research a project, what does that look like? What, um, you know, where, where are you looking? What are you looking at? What's informing you? It depends on the project. So let's say, um, I had to, I had a private label client um, and she's from Hawaii and I've never been to Hawaii. So I didn't want to be a hypocrite and be like, okay, well, here's an Arab making a Hawaiian perfume, right? And I've never even been there, yada, yada, yada. And um, so I had so much, so many conversations with her. She sent me an immense amount of images and information in my, in my drive. And then I found all kinds of old books on Hawaii from like vintage stores and things like that. Um, when it comes to something maybe a bit more specific, like I had a, I had someone ask me to recreate the scent of sour diesel. So weed, um, which is really kind of complex, right? Um, I took it on as a great challenge. Uh, I went into the constituents. So um, we have a lot of GC uh, research papers that um, school gave us. Let me, to, let me show you, yeah. Just to fill in um, the audience here. So GC is a gas chromatograph. So a GCMS, uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, is the way in which you can um, use technology to pull apart a smell into its individual molecular components. So in, in essence, you can sort of get a type of um, recipe for what are the individual molecular components in any fragrance. And so a GC looks something like this. Each of these peaks is a particular molecule, a concentration of, of molecule in, in the blend. You can find a lot of them online. You can. You can often Google for, um, maybe not necessarily for 
um, fragrances, but for materials. So for if you're, materials, like, exactly. I love Palo Santo. I have no idea how I want to recreate a Palo Santo Accord. You can take a look at a GCMS of that natural material and see what its individual components are. It might give you a, a sort exactly. of suggestion on where to start looking. So you do that sometimes. I do that often because everything is connected and everything is made of the same things. If you look into it really, really closely. And what's fascinating about weed is that it has a lot of the same constituents that you would find in citrus or flowers or um, woods. So it's about, uh, and it's a lot of them are found in the um, perfumer's palette. So these are things I already have. So it's looking at things from just a different perspective um, more than anything, and almost always I look at it from a very cross-modal perspective. So it's not always like that I look into perfume research. Sometimes I'll have, um, I'll have books like, uh, okay, I think these are super helpful. Um, I got this also from a thrift store, but turns out it's, um, it's called Aroma, the Cultural History of Smell. Hmm. It's uh, written by Constance Klassen, who is a professor here in Montreal, turns out, and she writes a lot on synesthesia. And then her partner in real life is a sensory studies professor also here called oh. David Howes. I'm assuming you've sent an email and introduced yourself to this fascinating. Uh, yeah, I mean, I met him asking him, do I have synesthesia? And he's like, if you think you have it, you probably do. I'm like, okay, that's not really uh, conclusive. Um, but yes, I've been wanting to talk to them, but unfortunately the sensory studies department here doesn't have a lot of budgets for outside people. Um, but I'm, uh, yeah, I'm up his butt like every year. In any case, this is a very, this is an anthropologi anthrop no, anthropological, perspective on scent and it teaches you so much about other cultures and so a lot of the research that I do sometimes it will just pop up from like years ago and be like oh wait didn't I read this here 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 and there so it's again always about seeing the connections um, but also yeah this gives you really really good perspective um, then this one is really interesting um, I'm trying to research outside of perfumery do you know what I mean so looking at things that are complementary to using fragrance, but are not necessarily like a very specific uh, formula-based type of knowledge. Is this designing, designing with smell. Landscape gardening with scented plants. Is that what that book is about? Sort of. No, it's designing with smell. So it's actually Victoria Henshaw, Kate McLean, who does the smell walks, um, and a bunch of other people actually, and there's different people telling you about different things. So you have experiential learning and all factory architectures. You have retail scent and service design. You have, um, what else? Where am I? Installation art, um, creating scent in space, cultural, culturalizing scent. So like uh, Ashraf and Klaus have a, an article in here um, from Scent Culture or the previously known Scent Culture Institute. In any case, I try to push, the more I'm in perfumery, the more I find inspiration in, from every angle and every um, uh, perspective because I feel like it actually informs me. And then this one is super interesting. I haven't even gone through it myself, all of it, all the way but it's called Synesthetic Design, a handbook for a multi-sensory approach. This could be for anyone. Very exciting. Very you know? Um, and then it depends again on how specific the project is. Like, you know, if I have an ancient Egypt project, I will look into ancient Egyptian stuff, you know? If it's, um, yeah, you're always kind of learning. Like my mom's an interpreter and she has to brief herself on every topic that she does before she interprets the work, right? And so you're learning about a different topic, a different industry, a different world. You're, you're learning about your brand. You know, I learn and do a lot of research on the person that I'm speaking to or the, the brand that I'm creating for. Um, speaking of yeah. getting to know who we're creating for, why don't we take the last 10 minutes or so that we have together to open up to some questions from the yes. audience. Yes, sorry uh, guys, I talk a lot. No. I'm so happy to hear questions. 
But yeah, we'd love to hear hear what your questions are. I think you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and pop into the conversation, yeah? So who's got a question? I'm just gonna say that Adam, I'm sending you the, the GC uh, data that I just found on Google for you. Um, so you have that. I did see the weed GC. So I didn't ha I did, um, I did kind of like a mix. So it wasn't, there is no weed GC per se, but I looked into what's in sour diesel and I realized, okay, there's myrcene, there's citronellol, there's linolol, there's limonene, a lot of limonene, uh, things like that. And you just play around with that. And then you add the funk, which is usually like, I don't know, for me, the, I found a material called Jiviscone, which I find kind of funky and herbaceous, the kind of like undertone. Um, I used to play around with patchouli, but it never worked. So just avoid that altogether. <laughs> so Donna, we had some questions earlier about setting up your lab. Um, yeah. What are the considerations you need to take in that? And um, how do you plan for stocking and consider, uh, you know, re-upping your stock if you go through the materials too quickly? Okay, uh, considerations for setting up a lab, yes. So generally you need a, an alcohol license. I don't have one because I work under a certain amount of uh, quantities per year. Um, when it comes to airflow, yes, I don't live in a building. I actually have like a, well, I do live in a building, but it's, um, it's like a two floors. So it's, there's air on both sides. So it's not a building with multiple, multiple, multiple apartments. It's not closed. Uh, Montreal is a little bit specific. Uh, ironically, I cannot get a studio because they think that perfume is toxic. So a lot of the time, we're not even allowed to get studio space because they think it's uh, it will hurt people. Um, so airflow, I always have airflow and there is no daylight or like specific, I, like I have an entire room on this side before. So everything is cool uh, and dry. And then I also have a lot of like my sensitive materials in the fridge. So maybe you never see the light of day. Um, and then the second one was about small quantities, Mineta, is that what it is? Um, if yeah. I find, oh, out of stock, that's, that's always a, even, even in working in large quantities, especially if you work with naturals, you are at the mercy of that supplier, no matter what. So it has nothing to do with quantity. It has everything to do with the quality of the material, the time of year, uh, the yield, which oil they have that year and et cetera. Um, so a lot of the times I'm playing kind of Tetris with multiple suppliers to make sure that I have the same materials. My biggest thing is finding the same material that smells the same throughout or is like stable, which oh, is also very benches, hard. Benches, yes. Super hard. There, there, there is a difference between benches of... Um, Batches, of yes. Yes, always, always. Um, but it, if you find a good supplier, the batch, the difference is minimal, you know, like if you, yeah. if you trust someone um, and they're pretty consistent, I would say stick with them. But again, it's also environment, especially when you're working with naturals, uh, you know, look at what happened to vetiver, look what ha what's happening to vanilla, um, all of that sort of thing. So it's usually the price that is, a, is, is, yeah, is difficult for them. Especially because I'm also buying in US dollars and the Canadian is super low at the moment. Okay, thanks. This is Virginia. Um, Dana, I, I have a question about something you touched on earlier, the emotional aspect of selling your um, creative babies. Um, and how you mitigate, you know, um, being too sensitive about what happens or you know what the reaction is um, by the general public or the um or you know the critics or your peers do you have any techniques that you have learned over time to employ to make yourself a little bit more um <laughs> armored <laughs> i don't know <laughs> you, that's a really good question I, uh, I, I'm just stronger and more resilient over time. So I think that's the only difference, but I'm very, very sensitive. But the thing is, I also have to always remind myself that anything that you make public or anything I make public is no longer mine in a way, you know, and it's, it's up to the mercy of 
whoever's wearing it. And perfume people, as we all know, are, are vicious sometimes when it comes to whether they like something or not, which is okay. Why are they, huh? Yeah, but it's totally okay. You are, it's, you're allowed to not like something. It's not a problem. I would actually hate a no reaction. Like if someone hates something that I make and, some, and they love something that I make, I'm okay with that. If you don't, if you feel blah or meh about something I made, that's when I'm like, oh no, 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 no. I did something wrong because I didn't, I didn't transfer the message strong enough. And if you feel like it's mediocre or so blah about it, then no, 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 something's wrong for sure. Okay, thank you. Dana, let me, let me jump in here too on top of Virginia's question and ask, is there, when you're going through the creative process, is there a time when you're ready to show it to other people? Maybe like you said, like we have a time where we show it to sort of more trusted colleagues and then later show it to like the population at large or are you showing work from the beginning? Is there sort of a pattern to see there or? Uh, I don't generally show it to a lot of people while I'm working on it. I'll show it to you almost always first. Um, and then once I feel really good about the formula, I will test it on people before I put it to market. So I'll generally, I, I don't have m many house parties anymore, but I used to have all kinds of friends of all kinds of ethnicities and genders. And that was good market research for me in that sense to be like, hey, do you like this? Does it test well on your skin? Are you reacting? Uh, do you love it? Do you hate it? You know, getting kind of just a general idea without telling them what it is too much and seeing how people react naturally um, is something I enjoy doing. With Fayoum, I didn't get a chance to do it so much. I've been very secretive about it because I was so um, hesitant to put it out there actually. So now, you know, it's a bit of a weird scent. I don't know if it's going to do well. I launched it online on my anniversary, my six year anniversary, but it was supposed to be launched in real life. So I have no idea if like, I can't really gauge if people like it or not and how it's going to do, um, you know? So I'm just trying to, I like it. I like it a lot, but you smelled an old version. So you don't know anymore. I, I know. I think it's chill. If people don't like it, people don't like it. You know, like I had uh, my D'Angelo inspired perfume, Solar One. I took it off the market. It's not discontinued because I don't want to break people's hearts that way. Like, you know, all of us, whenever you have, you have love a perfume and it's discontinued, like why? So I'm making it on like subscription basis, but I knew it wasn't going to be a commercial success. It had Castorium, it had Osmanthus. It was quite specific, but I love it. And I was happy with it. And like, that's what matters in a way or another. So you also have to, you have to be like, okay, you know what? Just surrender, surrender. Once you put it out there, surrender once you feel like it's ready. But a lot of perfumers, even when we were studying, they said, you, you'll never be finished. Like you can work on a formula forever. It never feels ready. You just have to, you just have to take the plunge and do it. So when do you, when do you know that it's ready to go out if it never feels ready? Perhaps when I overwork it and you know what I mean? And I'm like working it and working it, working it. I'm like, no, 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 no. Number three was fine. You know, you go too far and then you realize, oh, I'm messing with a good thing or you're adding too much just to, to, for what? So I always ask myself, why is my material in there? Why did I add it? Is it creating a story? Is it working with the other materials? Is it juxtaposing uh, in a balanced way? Um, am I, is it offensive? anything just to kind of like and also just take time away from it like I stopped touching it for a while and then I would go back to it and it's just almost always a overthinking mm. got to guard against the mind getting too much in the way of the creativity yeah because I mean in any art if you get too close to it and you're not objective about it in some way or another then there is no way for you to to share it because you do have to separate yourself in a way to be like, you're going to have to express what it is. And if you're still in that like artistic, oh, I don't know what I'm doing kind of phase, it doesn't, you're not going to sell it. That's for sure. And I'm start, I'm learning that, you know, because I also share aspects of a fragrance that most people may not find interesting. So it's, it's, it's all balance. It's all balance. Well, any other last questions? I think we are about 
Saskia, is that right? We're about close to our time. No? Yes. Yes, we're <laughs> close to our time. All for being here. And thank you so much, Dana, for sharing all about your practice. It's been fantastic for us to get a little window into the world of your creativity. Thank you so much for even caring to ask all these questions and peek into my brain. I hope I, I hope all the information was worth it for everybody and it was of value. If you ever need anything in terms of questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. And guys, just to jump in, Saskia, hello. Uh, Donna and Ashley, thank you. We're gonna be scheduling these talks over the course of the next few months with people that are smart and inspiring and have something to say just for moral support. I mean, for, uh, sorry, for morale. So if anybody has any ideas for people you want to have talk or spend a little time with, please email me and Manetta and Ashley at hello at artandolfaction.com and we'll do our best to schedule them. And Donna, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good seeing you. Hope we'll see you again soon. Yeah.